propose de commencer le, le séminaire. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment un grand plaisir pour moi d'accueillir Nikita Kavukin, qui, euh, qui a fait sa thèse ici à, à, à l'ENS à côté avec nous, et euh, sur, qui a développé notamment tous ces, ces superbes résultats, et qui après est parti faire un postdoc avec Antoine George à New York, au Flatiron Institute, donc sur des aspects purement quantiques, pour revenir euh, au Max Planck Institute à Mainz, euh, où il faut travailler... Euh, où il a, il a un, petit, un petit groupe, où il travaille en collaboration avec Micha Bonne autour d'interfaces et de systèmes. Et donc là, c'est de ça dont tu vas nous parler, je crois, Nikita. Ouais. Donc Nikita va parler en anglais, mais... Oui, merci beaucoup, Lédéric, pour la kind introduction. Et je vais parler anglais pour le séminaire. Mais je serai heureux de répondre aux questions en français. Donc, comme Lédéric a emphasized dans la lecture, The field of nanofluidics was born out of the possibility to manufacture these well-controlled artificial devices that can be studied at the single channel level. We went from microfluidic systems on the micron scale to nanopores typically drilled in silicon based membranes on 100 nanometer scales or so. And then quite recently we went down to molecular scale controlled confinement of fluids achieved now in all possible geometries, whether it is 0D nanopores, 1D nanotubes, or 2D nanoslits. And now the central question in uh, nanofluidics is essentially, does size matter? Uh, is water flowing through a macroscopic garden hose uh, really different from water flowing through one of these uh, tiny carbon nanotubes? Well, you've seen that the bulk transport equations are surprisingly robust. And for instance, uh, the steam Navier in Stokes would tell you, well, no, there's no difference. Their equation holds down to about one nanometer scales of three water molecules because you can still define a viscosity at this scale. However, there is a catch, and as Pauli famously said, the devil made the interfaces. And interfaces matter hugely at nanoscales. And this is just a question of surface to volume ratio. If we put numbers in there, well, in a three centimeter radius garden hose, one in a hundred million water molecules are in contact with the actual hose. However, in a three nanometer radius nanotube, well, one in five water molecules actually touch the nanotube surface. And this is going to result in very different boundary conditions for the fluid dynamics, or better said, the smaller the scale, the more precisely one will have to Uh, describe the solid-liquid interface to obtain the relevant boundary condition at that scale. Now, if we start in microscopic hydrodynamics and the same holds down to microfluidic length scales, well, uh, there we simply impose the no-slip boundary condition for the fluid at the wall. The fluid velocity vanishes regardless of what the wall is made of. And this results in the well-known Poiseuille's law for fluid flow within the channel, Ohm's law for electrolyte transport within solution. Now, if we go to uh, more nanofluidic link scales, hundreds of nanometers or so, well, uh, there, as Lidirik has introduced in the last uh, lecture, you need some more microscopic, but still uh, coarse-grained descriptors for the interface. Those are typically uh, the surface charge and the hydrodynamic slip length, which you have heard about today. Now, this... Uh, Uh, gives rise to a uh, bridge physics of coupled ion and fluid transport phenomenon to which I'm sure uh, one of the next lectures will be dedicated. However, I will not talk about this and I will talk instead about uh, even smaller uh, nanometer or sub-nanometer length scales, what people call single-digit nanopores. And, well, there you really need to describe the solid at the quantum level of its electronic properties. Now, this represents the ultimate breakdown of universality in some sense, because instead of talking to a generic wall, the fluid now talks to the whole zoology of condensed matter physics. And so I will focus today on the emerging quantum effects in this uh, ultimate regime. Now, the simplest way to see how condensed matter properties are going to impact fluid transport at nanoscales is through the idea of interaction confinement. So if you take a 
uh, point charge in vacuum, uh, then it produces some electric field lines that point isotropically away from the charge. Now, if you put it close to a solid surface, these electric field lines are going to be distorted, and this is due to this uh, uh, charge inducing some uh, polarization charges uh, in the solid here. And so, uh, I say that a particle is interaction confined when its Coulomb potential is significantly screened by the nearby solid. Uh, and so here you see that uh, this polarization charge is going to be uh, governed obviously by some volume electronic property of the solid, something like the electric function. So here you see condensed matter physics coming in. Now, if we put this particle between uh, two surfaces so as to form a channel and this channel is filled with water then oh, uh, then uh, the electric field lines are actually going to be confined within the channel and this uh, has huge consequences for uh, ion transport and solution. In fact the effective Coulomb interactions corresponding to these distorted field lines will be much stronger than the usual ionic interactions in bulk solutions and this will produce a wealth of nonlinear correlated effects in the ion transport. Stay tuned for the next lectures. Uh, but what I would like to talk about today is instead what happens to uh, water in this interaction confinement regime. After all, water molecules, they have dipoles, they also produce Coulomb potentials, these should be uh, interaction confined. And in some sense, what happens to water is more interesting than what happens to ions because ions have some slow diffusive dynamics and they're only likely to couple to some static uh, electronic properties of the surrounding solid. However, water has some much faster fluctuations in the terahertz frequency range or so. And so we may expect water to couple to dynamic electronic properties. And so indeed this is what happens. So if we take uh, to start with one water molecule above a solid surface. Then, well, it creates a polarization charge within the solid and this polarization is conveniently described by the so-called surface response function that Lederich has previously introduced. So this G of Q and omega in Fourier space and physically what it gives you is the potential induced by the solid in the upper half space in, in response to an evanescent plane wave external potential applied in the lower half space. So now if our water molecule moves at some velocity parallel to the solid surface, then what's going to happen is that the polarization charge will slightly lag behind so that this water molecule will be subject to a friction force called an electronic friction force, which is expressed in terms uh, of the imaginary part of the surface response function at the typical frequency of the water motion. Now, this electronic friction is actually a, uh, an effect known for, uh, for decades in a completely uh, other context, in the context of energetic ions and near the walls of nuclear reactors, not at all applied to fluids. But, uh, so now this is interesting for us in the case of fluids and uh, well for a fluid what we would like to know is not the friction force on an individual water molecule but the total hydrodynamic friction coefficient. So uh, then what we're saying is that well in the usual hydrodynamic uh, theory of friction uh, as Lederich has emphasized it's a question of, uh, of surface roughness really these water molecules in kinetic theory view, they bump on the atomic scale roughness of the solid and they transfer the momentum of the fluid directly to the crystal lattice. Now what we're saying is that uh, the fluid is also going to be transferring some momentum directly to the electrons and this momentum transfer we call quantum friction. Now in the uh, lecture you have seen a semi-classical way to approach this quantum friction based on this uh, famous Green-Kuber relation. So the friction coefficient is expressed in terms of the correlation function of the equilibrium solid-liquid friction force. And then if we decompose this uh, force into a static component corresponding just to the atomic scale roughness of the solid, 
uh, then from this we get the classical contribution and then in addition we have a dynamic part due to fluctuations of the solid and this essentially is going to give you this quantum contribution that's related to electronic fluctuations. Uh, however, this is a uh, semi-classical approach which is not uh, entirely rigorous in the quantum case and in fact it doesn't give the full results. So if we really want to derive quantum friction then we need to do fluid dynamics much like we do condensed matter physics. And so the idea is that uh, well we need to describe in a uh, we need to describe the full couple dynamics of these uh, water molecules that interact with an electronic system. Now because the electrons have uh, some intrinsically quantum dynamics then we need to describe the whole system in a quantum way. And the way we do this is that we describe water by its fluctuating charge density and uh, this fluctuation ch charge density formally becomes a quantum Gaussian field much like a phonon field. And then we actually get a problem that is really similar to an electron phonon problem uh, in condensed matter. We have this interaction Hamiltonian that comprises electron water and electron electron Coulomb interactions. Uh, and given this interaction, what we want to compute is the solid liquid friction force, which is simply the Coulomb force that the electrons exert on the water. However, there is a catch because, well, uh, in principle, this type of thing, it's a standard perturbation theory computation, but if we want to have a friction force, we need to have a liquid flow. So the system is out of equilibrium. And so we need to do this computation in the so-called Keldish non-equilibrium framework of perturbation theory. And so uh, in order for it not to be just some scary word I throw around to pretend I'm doing something complicated, let me just try to uh, give a flavor of uh, what this Keldish framework entails. So uh, suppose first we're doing a regular equilibrium quantum mechanics. Well, and for simplicity, let's assume that we are at zero temperature. So what we want to do is compute the mean values of some uh, observables, operators, in the system's ground state. But this ground state here is still a mini-body interacting ground state that we don't know uh, how to compute. So the way we usually deal with this is that we invent a convenient time evolution. So we start in the distant past from a system where the interactions have been switched off. It's a non-interacting ground state. Then we adiabatically switch on the interactions. Once they're on, we apply our operator of interest. Then we adiabatically switch off the interactions. So then we're left uh, with the non-interacting ground state, which uh, we know it's a single particle problem. And a two forward in time evolution operators, which are then the quantities that are expanded in perturbation theory with all the Feynman diagrams, etc. Now, this scheme rests on the assumption that the state of the system in the distant past without interactions and the state in the future after the interaction switching procedure differ only by a phase factor. This is the normalization factor in the denominator here. However, if our system now undergoes a general non-equilibrium evolution under some external fields, then there is absolutely no reason that even after we switch off the perturbation, it's going to end up again in this ground state. It's going to be in some superposition of excited states. So the only way we can compute our observable of interest is take the non-interacting system uh, in the distant past, switch on the interactions and the non-equilibrium perturbation, apply our operator, then evolve the system back in time, uh, where we again know the state of the system in the distant past. And so then in the expression for the quantum mechanical average, we get uh, both forward and backward in time evolution operators. And so in our perturbation theory, time is going to live on this uh, rather particular quantum that goes first forwards, then backwards in time. And just a point of notation here, uh, to be clear, I've written the average in terms of the density matrix rho because uh, this is actually done in thermal quantum mechanics at finite temperature, but this is just notation and the physical idea is really the same as at zero temperature. So uh, this counter time is an obvious uh, complication. In fact, uh, 
and technically it means that when you want to compute correlation functions of two quantities like what Lederich has been computing in the semi-classical case earlier, well, these things become some uh, matrix-valued objects because they depend on the part of the contour forward going or backward going on which we choose the time that's where the operator is taken. However, uh, such a non-equilibrium approach also has an advantage because, uh, well, you've seen if we, you try to evaluate a friction coefficient in an equilibrium formalism, exactly like what Lederich has done on the board, you need to compute some force-force correlation function, and in there you get four density operators. However, if we do the computation directly out of equilibrium, we compute directly the friction force, only two density operators. And so partly thanks to this uh, key simplification, we were able in this quantum formalism to push the computation of the solid liquid friction down to a uh, closed form result, which splits into two terms, the usual classical surface roughness term that you've seen before, I'm not writing it down again, and this uh, new term that we call the quantum term that now involves the overlap of uh, the surface response functions of the liquid and the solid. So we have this contribution to friction due to the coupling of charge fluctuations between the liquid and the solid. And uh, indeed what we get mainly in addition to the semi-classical estimate is this denominator here corresponding to all the beyond first order interactions between the liquid and the solid and this actually plays an important role quantitatively. So what type of fluctuations are we talking about? Let me just quickly remind you that uh, in this formula we care only about low energy thermal fluctuations because of this uh, hyperbolic sine squared in the denominator and also very short wavelength fluctuations because the integrand sc here scales like the momentum uh, Q cubed. So, uh, uh, and you've seen this in the lecture, I'll go quickly on this. Uh, what are these fluctuations concretely? Well, if we have a uh, if we're looking at the solid, for it to have lower energy charge excitations, it needs to have some conduction electrons, and then the spectrum contains these incoherent particle hole excitations and possibly a surface plasmon mode. So that's an artistic representation of a plasmon, some wave-like collective charge excitation. And for uh, the liquid, we're talking about these molecular scale charge fluctuations that I like to generically call hydrons because they Formally, they're really like phonons. Uh, uh, Derek mentioned the Dubai mode, which is indeed the main contribution for this friction. There is also the libration mode and other particular modes. <clears throat> and so up to now, this is just some formal correction uh, to the hydrodynamic friction coefficient. But uh, the key interesting thing is that we found uh, this contribution in fact plays a crucial role at the water carbon interface. And again, this has been tackled in the lecture, so I will go quickly on this. Let me just remind you that the main puzzle of the water carbon interface was, well, there were these uh, puzzling uh, results in carbon nanotubes, where the smaller the tube, the more slippery it is. And there have actually also been some experimental results for water friction on graphene and graphite, which found that uh, for water, graphene is much more slippery than graphite. And so, uh, thanks to our theory of quantum friction, we can understand this fact that materials with this exactly the same surface roughness have different hydrodynamic friction. It's a question of different uh, charge fluctuations, particularly plasmon modes in graphene and graphite. And let me emphasize that it's a, just a question of geometry. Really, in graphene, the electrons can only oscillate in the plane of the single carbon layer, and this is the quite fast oscillation at around 50 terahertz, much faster than the one terahertz or so the bimode of water, while in graphite the main difference is that the electrons can oscillate in between the layers, that's a differently polarized plasmon. Uh, this oscillation is much slower, around 5 terahertz, and so this leads to a much higher quantum contribution to friction. And then in the nanotubes, well, the large ones are like graphite, the electrons can tunnel in between the layers, so we have this plasmon. The smaller ones are like graphene because the layers are misaligned and the electrons localize within the individual layers. There is no interlayer plasmon. We can incorporate this into the theory and uh, this way understand the experimental data. 
so uh, with the lecture plus this reminder, I hope that uh, you are convinced that we need at some point some quantum mechanics to uh, really understand uh, fluid transport at the nanoscale. Now, to be fair, the water dynamics here remains essentially classical. We can still determine the surface response functions quite reliably from classical molecular dynamics simulations. However, this water couples to the solids electrons, which uh, have intrinsically quantum dynamics. And so starting from this understanding world, we would like to uh, go back to experiments and uh, ask two questions. First, is any of this true? Can we have some uh, direct experimental indications that this is actually taking place, that this mechanism exists? And second, can, what can we do with this? Can we make anything useful out of these quantum interfacial effects? So we've recently made uh, some progress along uh, both these questions. And uh, first, I would like to tell you about an experimental test for the quantum friction mechanism that we uh, have been developing. So, well, how do you test experimentally uh, quantum friction? Ideally, you'd want to measure hydrodynamic friction on materials with different electronic properties and see if it matches the theoretical prediction. However, uh, you know from the lecture that these hydrodynamic friction measurements are exceedingly hard and are extremely sensitive to the surface state of the sample. And so in many cases, even if a material has interesting electronic properties, it is likely to have significant surface roughness and the uh, total hydrodynamic friction that an experiment will measure will be dominated by the classical contribution. Now, a way uh, around uh, this issue is to measure heat transfer instead of measuring friction. Because indeed, if we uh, uh, think about these two processes in this quantum picture of modes and excitations, well, they are practically the same thing. If we consider just uh, one mode, so actually two modes, one in the solid, one in the liquid, at the same frequency uh, omega q, then in the case of quantum friction, what happens is that, uh, well, there are more excitations in the liquid mode than in the solid mode because the liquid is moving as a sort of Doppler shift effect. Now, because the solid and the liquid uh, interact, these elementary excitations, quasi-particles, can tunnel in between the liquid and solid modes. Because this one has higher occupation, there is a net quasi-particle tunneling rate between the liquid and the solid we count the momentum transferred by these quasi-particles, we get the quantum friction. Now, in the case of heat transfer, well, we'll see that it will be the solid mode that has higher occupation than the liquid mode, and it will be simply because the solid is at a higher temperature, then we have, again, a net quasi-particle tunneling rate from the solid to the liquid, and we count the amount of energy carried by these quasi-particles, we get the uh, thermal power that is being transferred. And so, uh, really along the lines of the Keldish theory of quantum friction, we can uh, derive uh, a formula for uh, the heat transfer rate between a solid and a liquid. Again, it involves this overlap between surface response functions. But, well, to be fair, uh, heat transfer, what's called near-field radiative heat transfer, to be precise, is a much better studied subject than uh, friction. And actually, this formula has been uh, derived by other means. See, for instance, this uh, famous review by uh, Velikitsyn and Person. So anyway, uh, friction and heat transfer are practically the same. But how do we measure heat transfer? Uh, well, uh, my colleagues and mine, so uh, uh, Professor Misha Bon and one of the students, have a very nice uh, spectroscopic uh, way of doing this, which is called optical pump terahertz probe spectroscopy. So the idea is that we have a graphene sample in a flow cell that can be filled with any desired liquid. And then the electrons in the graphene are heated up almost instantaneously by an optical excitation pulse. And then the relaxation of the electron temperature over time is 
probed with terahertz pulses. Essentially, the terahertz absorption of the graphene can be directly related to the electron temperature. So what we get is these traces of electron temperature over time after photo excitations. We can fit these with exponentials and obtain the electron cooling time for the different liquids and a different initial electron temperatures, which are set by the pump pulse power. And so what we see across all uh, excitation powers is that electrons in graphene cool faster in the presence of water, but the cooling is almost unaffected by other rather similar liquids, here methanol and ethanol. Uh, there is also this uh, curious isotope effect where the cooling is slightly faster with water than with heavy water. <clears throat> And so could this faster cooling be due to a direct energy transfer uh, between uh, the graphene electrons and the liquid? Well, for this we have uh, the theory and in order to obtain a prediction for this heat transfer rate, we need again these surface response functions. For graphene we know how to compute it and for the liquids we actually measure them uh, by uh, infrared absorption spectroscopy. And so here I'm plotting the theoretical prediction from this formula for the liquid's contribution to the electron cooling rate, the inverse of the cooling time for the different liquids. And uh, you see that we obtain uh, cooling rates in the inverse picosecond range really on par with the experiment and we also reproduce the trend with the different liquids. So uh, this direct liquid mediated heat transfer seems to be uh, reasonable hypothesis and so now we can uh, use the theory to obtain some more molecular scale insight into what's going on. So if we look at uh, the surface response function of graphene, well uh, you've seen that it has this uh, typical plasmon mode with the square root dispersion, essentially it exists at frequencies around 100 milli electron volt. Now uh, in this uh, uh, frequency region, if we look at the liquids here, here are the liquid spectra just as a function of frequency, they don't depend much on momentum, we see that uh, only water and heavy water have a significant spectral density in this region as opposed to uh, methanol and ethanol. So we understand how water is special and now if we plot the spectrally resolved energy transfer rate, so the uh, integrand of this thing uh, resolved in energy momentum space, then we see that the main contribution to the heat transfer comes from a resonance here between the graphene plasmon and a particular hydron mode, uh, in fact the libration mode, which corresponds to hindered rotations of the water molecules. So uh, really from matching theory and experiment we get uh, molecular scale insight into what's going on in this heat transfer. We see interaction between this uh, graphene plasmon and the libration mode and incidentally we understand the isotope effect because heavy water, well, as its name indicates, is heavier so these rotations are a bit slower uh, and so this accounts for uh, the slightly lower heat transfer. <clears throat> and so in this way these experiments provide an indication direct experimental indication of the basic mechanism of quantum friction which is the coupling of collective modes at the solid-liquid interface. And incidentally we find that electron-electron interactions are crucial in this process. Indeed everything relies on, the, on this plasmon hydron resonance and well for a plasmon we need electron-electron interactions. We switch interactions off, there is no plasmon. And we can do this computation with electron-electron interactions switched off. We uh, actually overestimate the electron cooling rate by uh, more than an order of magnitude. So uh, this type of um, problem has to be approached in a fully quantum formalism and uh, cannot be tackled with a Boltzmann type single particle approach like is often done in the literature. <clears throat> so now uh, let me uh, tell you briefly about something useful we can make out of uh, these quantum interfacial effects. So, in fact, we get a, a glimpse of something useful that happens here, 
if we uh, relax one of the important assumptions of quantum friction theory that I uh, have been sweeping under the rug a bit up till now. Uh, indeed, we have considered that, well, uh, the liquid transfers some momentum to the electrons, but these electrons remain at equilibrium. So this amounts to saying that they relax <coughs> their momentum fast enough. This is typically true for a three-dimensional sample where momentum just diffuses into the bulk away from the surface. But if we take, say, some 2D material that's weakly coupled to the underlying substrate, then there is no reason that this momentum is relaxed particularly fast, and there may be some momentum accumulation within the electrons. And what is momentum accumulation within the electrons? Well, this is an electric current. And so this uh, uh, condensed matter-like vision of the solid-liquid interface immediately tells us that the flow of a neutral liquid along a surface should induce an electronic current within that surface. And we can call this type of phenomenon hydrodynamic Coulomb drag by analogy with the uh, well-known uh, condensed matter phenomenon, Coulomb drag, where you flow an electric current along one two-dimensional layer and you then induce a current in a closely placed but electrically insulated other two-dimensional layer. And so we have uh, observed this uh, type of flow induced electronic current experimentally. Now, the experiment has been carried out in Lederich's lab by uh, Alice Marcotte and Mathieu Lisée. And so what they did was to take a little liquid droplet and use an atomic force microscope to deposit it on a multi-layer graphene sample connected to a couple of electrodes and oscillate it, oscillate this droplet in between the electrodes. And so what they saw was this uh, current through the electrodes at the frequency of the droplet oscillation, so a electronic current induced by the liquid flow. Now a curious thing about these experiments is that uh, corrugation in the sample helps the current generation. There uh, was a way actually of making these samples with different degrees of corrugation from nearly atomically smooth to uh, 100 nanometer scale wrinkles. And so what is found is that the stronger the corrugation, the stronger the current generation. Now, is uh, generating electronic currents by liquid flow completely surprising? Well, actually not completely. Uh, there have been observations over the years of these flow-induced electronic currents. For instance, these uh, experiments from one Lingua's group uh, even used a similar droplet geometry. But most of these experiments found some uh, not very exciting explanations from the microscopic point of view. Uh, essentially, it was always found that the liquid behaves like some sort of average external potential that just drags the electrons around. In, in this experiment, uh, the authors proposed that there is some ion adsorption at the surface and these ions just push around the electrons. But the key difference between this experiment and the previous experiments is the scale. This is a millimeter-sized droplet, this is a micrometer-sized droplet, and so if we take the theoretical explanation proposed here and scale it down to the scale of our experiment, well, the expected current is around 10 femtoamperes and we measure 10 nanoamperes, so six order of magnitude uh, discrepancy, something, uh, something else must be happening. And so uh, together uh, with uh, Baptiste Coquinot, a very talented PhD student who is in the audience, uh, we set out to uh, develop a theory for uh, this possible hydrodynamic Coulomb drag. And uh, what emerges is that it's all a game of momentum transfer. In quantum plumbing, we deal with momentum leaks. <clears throat> the, the starting point is the theory of quantum friction. Well, we have the liquid transferring momentum directly to the electrons. Uh, and we want to know how much momentum these electrons accumulate. And this momentum accumulation can be described by an average drift velocity of the electrons that we call the electronic wind velocity. Now, if we want to compute this wind velocity, well, we need to actually describe how the electrons relax their momentum. And this is where we need phonons in the picture, because the main way electrons relax their momentum is by scattering with phonons. But especially in the rough samples that uh, are considered in the experiments, 
the phonons play another major role uh, because well, there is classical friction and water molecules bump directly in the surface roughness and transfer momentum directly to those phonons. These phonons also accumulate momentum. This can again be described by a drift velocity we call the phonon wind. And this phonon wind can then push on the electrons and contribute also to uh, the electric current. This type of mechanism can be called phonon drag. And so, well, uh, uh, to keep a long story short, we uh, put all this uh, coupled system in the uh, machinery of non-equilibrium perturbation theory. The, the electric current is given by this, these nice ice cone diagrams, and we could obtain a closed expression in the end with which we can uh, quantitatively reproduce the experiment. For instance, here we are uh, reproducing the dependence of the generated current on the graphene doping level. However, what is uh, more interesting to me is uh, what happens uh, physically. For instance, are we seeing uh, more Coulomb drag or more phonon drag? Well, what the theory tells us is that uh, the phonons are in fact much faster than the liquid flow. Uh, this is because they receive a lot of momentum by this classical friction, especially on the wrinkled samples, and then they relax it relatively slowly, mainly through unclap processes where essentially they give the momentum to the substrate of the 2D material. <clears throat> then uh, the second thing we learn is that uh, well, the phonon wind and the liquid flow compete for the electronic wind velocity. Uh, and so, uh, so formerly, this electronic wind is given by a weighted average of the phonon wind and of the liquid flow velocity. And so this tells us that in the presence of direct electron-liquid color interactions, the uh, electron wind is actually slower than what it would be without these direct color interactions. In a way, Coulomb drag slows down the electric current because uh, the Coulomb interaction with the liquid provides a supplementary momentum relaxation pathway for the electrons. But this is in fact a far-reaching uh, observation because if uh, electrons relax their momentum to the fluid, it means that quantum friction is negative in this instance. Now, how is this possible? We used to have nicely positive quantum friction, now it's negative, what's going on? Well, uh, it's actually just a question of surface roughness. Uh, now, when we considered uh, the initial theory of quantum friction and tried to understand the uh, slippage differences in, uh, between graphene and graphite, well, we were uh, trying to describe some uh, really atomically smooth samples where the classical friction is uh, extremely small. Uh, and so there is no significant form on wind and the fluid mainly loses its momentum by uh, direct transfer to the electrons, so quantum friction, which is indeed a positive friction in this case. However, if we have a uh, rougher sample, like in the phonon drag experiment, well, there the fluid mostly loses its momentum by uh, giving it to the phonons. This produces this very fast phonon wind, which then pushes the electrons that end up going faster than the flow. And so this electronic current, faster than the flow, helps the liquid flow along the surface. And we call this mechanism a quantum feedback of the solid on the liquid. Now using our theory, we can compute uh, this uh, negative uh, contribution to the friction. So here lambda is the total friction coefficients. It's reduced, it's reduced from the classical value by an amount delta lambda, uh, which has this expression here. And well, as qualitatively expected, it's uh, determined by the competition between the momentum relaxation in the solid and the momentum return to the fluid. So here, uh, this uh, lambda EH for electron hydrogen represents the quantum friction coefficient, momentum return. This uh, lambda UM accounts for unclap processes. This tells you how fast the momentum is relaxed. And you see that if quantum friction is large and unclap friction is small, then you get a large delta lambda. 
And if we evaluate this quantitatively, well, it turns out this effect is far from negligible. If we take graphene, then at the highest achievable electronic densities, the expected friction reduction is around 12%. Well, in our experiment, uh, we are operating at smaller charge densities, so concretely in this experiment, uh, this doesn't play a significant role. However, graphene is not the best system to observe this friction reduction. And for instance, if we make a prediction for uh, just a two-dimensional electron gas with a unit electron mass, then at reasonable electronic densities, we can get up to 60% hydrodynamic friction reduction. And so um, this quantum feedback mechanism actually provides a somewhat counterintuitive uh, practical way of uh, reducing the hydrodynamic friction on the surface, which consists in maximizing the quantum friction coefficient so uh, as to have a momentum return to the fluid, which is as efficient as possible. And this has to be coupled with the minimization of relaxation processes for the momentum within the solid. So typically have a clean to dematerial that weakly interacts with the underlying substrate. And with this, well, uh, I would like to conclude with the key message of this talk, which was that at the nanoscale, hydrodynamics can talk to condensed matter physics. This is because hydrodynamic flows can interact with uh, electronic flows and fluctuations, and this produces this wealth of uh, what I call quantum interfacial effects. I've talked about quantum friction, uh, near-field heat transfer, which has an analogous mechanism, uh, Coulomb drag and the associated quantum feedback. And the goal with all these effects now is to do some uh, actual quantum plumbing, so engineer nanoscale flows beyond what one could do classically. Uh, now, uh, plumbing cannot be done without plumbers, so I would like to use this occasion to uh, advertise open PhD and postdoc positions in my group in Mainz. Uh, and thank you for your attention.